Good morning. It's a privilege to be in this room full of exceptionally wonderful human beings, um, including and especially my, uh, my colleagues and friends, uh, Councillor Bev Esslinger, uh, and I haven't heard that story before, Bev, so I'm glad still. Uh, but thank you for sharing that with us, and uh, I'll talk about you a little more in a minute. Councillor McKean, I have very little to say about other than, <laughs> other than to acknowledge that we are uh, in Ward 6 territory, in addition to being in Treaty 6 territory. Uh, but it's great to have Scott here, and it's great to, uh, to have really good support from uh, um, all of our City Council. Uh, for the work that uh, Bev is leading and that I am at best assisting with uh, in the Women's Initiative. Um, but uh, I think our council understands, uh, all of us, the importance of inclusion across all of the different fault lines in our community that we need to remedy if we wish to achieve true equality, including and especially gender equality, which runs through every single one of the other fault lines that exist in our community. Um, uh, Councillor Riddell, it's wonderful to see you here as well, um, and uh, uh, our friends from the legislature, uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful to have you here and participating as well, and to uh, Bridget Stirl Sterling, our new uh, uh, trustee for Edmonton Public, it's wonderful to see you here as well. <laughs> so I want to start by telling you about four really important people in my life, um, uh, one of whom is a man and three of whom are women, and that's just a sort of a coincidence. The, uh, the first person who's given me a lot of really extraordinary mentorship is Stan Milner, the guy after whom the downtown library is named. And some of you may or may not know that uh, in addition to being a very successful entrepreneur, uh, he was for a time a city councillor in our city, and he ran for mayor and lost. And to Horlack, actually, so, but uh, I'll leave it at that. No more editorializing. So. Um, and I think Stan would have been an extraordinary mayor because he's an extraordinary human being. And he's uh, been kind enough to provide me some, some mentorship um, over the years. But he, uh, he told a story uh, at an event I was at where we were acknowledging um, Linda Cook, who was until recently the uh, CEO of Edmonton Public Library. And he was celebrating her work, her leadership, her accomplishments. And he was describing the women in his life who have done extraordinary things. And he said, if you want to get anything done in this world, surround yourself with smart women. And I think that that's very, very good advice. And so I want to tell you about three of those very smart women. Uh, two of them are here. Uh, one of them is Linda Cochran, who is uh, uh, stepping in uh, gallantly to the role of acting city manager. And you know her as the cabbie whisperer. <laughs> <coughs> But uh, she is one of the shrewdest operators, and I mean that in the kindest way, <laughs> at the city, um, and uh, is way smarter than she lets on, and I have all the time in the world for Linda, and I'm glad that she's here and glad that she's continuing to provide the same kind of leadership she has throughout her career of public service at the city of Edmonton, but, um, but continuing and especially working with Bev on uh, uh, the internal work at the city of Edmonton. Uh, another person who some of you may know, some of you may not know, is Julie Charchin, who's my chief of staff. She's here. Why don't you wave and be recognized? <laughs> now, I will tell you that I hired Julie on uh, merit because she is one of the smartest political minds and policy thinkers that I've met in my time in public service. Um, it just so happens, it's a bonus, that she's a woman. And she brings that gender lens uh, to the work uh, of the office of the mayor, uh, and it is invaluable, and it adds to our team, and it's an indispensable part of uh, the thought leadership that I get in my office. And so um, I, I get to step out front as the mayor, but I'm surrounded by a very, very good team of city councillors, a very, very good team of city administrators. Uh, and a very, very good team in my office, and Julie leads that team, and so she deserves to be recognized as well. And the third person, of course, some of you will have met, is my wife, Sarah, um, who is, reminds me that uh, she does three kinds of work, one of which gets uh, paid. Um, she, uh, she's a music teacher, and that is her, her primary vocation for which she does get paid, and she still does that about 30 hours a week. In addition to, uh, and we struggle with this 
question of the title. Uh, the default is first lady, which is sort of fun to play with, but also sort of weird. Um, <laughs> So, and we're never quite sure whether we're comfortable with that or not. And so uh, sometimes I call her the first citizen of Edmonton because I think that that's a little more exclusive and it doesn't diminish her in any way uh, into a secondary role because uh, she works harder than anybody else I know to try to make a change in this community in terms of people who don't get paid to do so. Uh, many, many people uh, work very hard in leadership roles uh, for which they are employed because they're fantastic at it. But but Sarah's leadership, uh, working with the United Way, uh, working with groups like iHuman, uh, working as, uh, as a big sister with big brothers and big sisters, all of these other things that she does as a volunteer, that's probably another 40 hours a week. And she does all of that. And she has access to those opportunities because of the role that I have. Um, but very quickly, she establishes herself as meritorious of those opportunities fully in her own right. And so uh, she doesn't always get recognition for that, but I will certainly give her recognition for that. And finally, of course, we have two young children, which is um, a challenge and an issue for young people of either gender or any gender expression um, who have young families um, to, to deal with the rigors of public life. And so Sarah effortlessly manages an army of nannies and, and babysitters and helpers and extended family who help us juggle uh, the sort of 40 to 50 hours a week of uh, uh, childcare that we need to support um, her work, her unpaid work, and um, my schedule. And so, uh, as you can see, I've taken Stan Milner's advice, and between Linda and Julie and Sarah and Bev and the WAVE committee, I am absolutely doing my level best to surround myself with smart women in order to be able to effectively lead the city. And Scott's very much uh, in touch with his feminine side as well. So, <laughs> so uh, we're here to uh, celebrate, I think, first of all, the work that has happened to date, which has been uh, very, very strong, um, and to reflect a little bit on the work that lies ahead. And uh, Bev has given us uh, a, a wonderful testimony to the importance of uh, the work of the WAVE Committee and the Women's Initiative. Um, and I, uh, I want to acknowledge in particular uh, Jackie Ford, who is the chair of, of WAVE and all of the WAVE members who are here for ensuring that uh, City Council benefits from the advice of an exceptionally strong group of women who have uh, great connectivity to so many different parts of this community. And I think we've just scratched the surface of where they can provide us advice. And Bev mentioned the example of the uh, sexual harassment um, campaign advocacy. Uh, but that was, that was a turning point, I think. That rocked the city, uh, the city administration a little bit. And frankly, a, a, a department that is led overwhelmingly by men that did not understand this finally came to understand it. Um, only because the men on council began to understand it in a way that would not have been possible without the strong leadership of the WAVE Committee and the thoughtful presentation that they and other women who came and presented offered up to our city. And so you are making a difference already, not just in getting the campaign started, but in shaking some cobwebs loose in an organization that, like many large organizations, and. Um, many ancient organizations, which the city is in many ways, uh, need, that, need that perspective shift. And so you are already having uh, that effect, and it will continue to reverberate, and I can't wait to see how. And this work inside the city, the women at the city work, is, uh, is critically important as well to ensure that, of course, you know, we, we employ 11,000 people. We want to be an employer of choice. We want to be an inclusive and welcoming employer. And so some of the, the work that we've done to understand uh, the, the needs of women in the workplace, the, challenge, the challenges that they face, uh, continues everything from uh, the continuing employee engagement survey to understand where there are issues of discrimination or, or <laughs> Uh, other barriers to, to advancement that exist in our city, to, uh, on, a, on a more positive note, looking at uh, understanding uh, the need for childcare to support um, our younger employees with balancing their family obligations with their desire to advance their career of public service in the city. And so 
I'm pleased that uh, in the new office building that um, about two-thirds of our downtown staff will be moving into, there will be childcare. Uh, and we were, we were, <laughs> and we established that because we asked our staff and understood what the need would be, and um, that I believe fully will make us an employer of choice downtown uh, in a very competitive labor environment for skilled workers. Uh, and, and it's not just us. ATB has uh, a similar um, facility in there. Uh, for, for child care in their new building and I think we're going to see this more and more from employers and one day though I'm not quite sure where we would put it one day I would love to see a daycare in City Hall um, but for now it's going to be down the street at our new office building so that'll have to do but we're making progress there as well and our council has has taken this work very seriously um, in uh, the recent creation of a, uh, a gender-based violence prevention initiative and uh, uh, it was an aha moment for me to understand that violence against women is not, strictly speaking, only violence against women. It is overwhelmingly violence by men against women. And I think men in this community are increasingly taking ownership over that, responsibility for that, speaking out about that. It is not a women's issue. It is a community issue. Uh, it's driving law enforcement costs, and you hear the chief and I you know, joshing each other about how expensive police is becoming uh, for our community. Well, that is something I would really rather our police weren't having to deal with and that they could chase actual bad guys doing actual bad things. Though uh, men who are committing uh, gender-based violence are bad guys. Um, and, and, but I would like to see that trend stop. I would like to see it not be culturally permissible. Um, I would like to see the underlying um, uh, sort of bro culture uh, change. Um, I want my son to grow up to not find, to, to find that as unacceptable as I find it and to be encouraged to speak out about it and to hold his peers accountable to it uh, so that my daughter is not uh, living in a society where any gender-based violence is ever acceptable. And so uh, council is, is uh, by creating that initiative, taking that seriously, which is one of the, the indicators that uh, uh, that is a source of concern in the uh, uh, Center for Policy Alternatives uh, survey. And uh, certainly uh, the work of uh, uh, my task force to end poverty has indisputably had a gender dimension to it as we have seen time and time again through the statistics. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But um, this work matters more and more because uh, our, our community is becoming increasingly diverse and I am so thrilled to see that diversity reflected in this room today. We welcome more and more newcomers from around the world. We welcome more and more indigenous people from other parts of Canada, rural, remote, east and west uh, uh, to the city. And, and we are on a path together to reconciliation. And so there's an intersection of um, gender equality issues in each one of these points and so for us to be able to make good decisions in that changing community we must have inclusion for the reasons that that Bev discussed and and I sort of think of myself as a, a sort of a multilateralist or a multi-stakeholder I don't assume that I have all of the answers until I've done my research and heard from everybody and then I know I have the answer but up to that point well it's tough I mean it's a it's a it's a very it's, it's not the most collaborative process at City Hall when you have to finally make a decision. The Municipal Government Act says you must vote and you have a choice. You can vote yes or you can vote no. Everything has to be reduced into an oppositional or polarized kind of decision. And those, that process works really well if a lot of thoughtful dialogue has happened on the front end to build a consensus about something that people can say yes to. Um, and that's the work that I like to do, and that's the work Bev likes to do, and that's the work Scott likes to do, and that's the work that many of our councillors and city administrators and, and uh, uh, leaders out there in the public space like to do, is build that consensus. But to do that authentically, you have to have all those perspectives in the room. You have to have a multi-stakeholder process. Uh, and that's a jargony way of saying you have to have the people in the room who are going to be affected by the decision. And you have to not just have them in the room, you have to create conditions where they will speak openly and they will only do that if they understand that they're going to be heard and uh, that their input is going to actually have an impact. And we're not there yet. 
but our council initiative on public engagement has reinforced this for us that you have to create that, that authentic engagement. And that's why WAVE is so important, is to create um, a venue for that. That's why these symposiums are very important, is to create a venue for that where uh, people can speak freely and, be, and know that they will be heard and have confidence that it will impact decisions. And then it's less important who is actually on the city council, though we still have to work to make the council more reflective. But if you've had an authentic engagement that it considers the full range of diversity and opinions in the community, it matters a little bit less who's making the decisions at the end, because all the important decisions have already been made, and the consensus in the community has been achieved. And then what you want is a representative and a suitably diverse group of councillors to be able to sign off on that. Now that's when it works well, and that's when there's a consensus to be achieved. The tougher ones are where you actually have what sometimes are called wicked problems. Things that have uh, deep philosophical or historical or ideological complexity to them or real public controversy to them or the press is whipping something into a fury or personalities get involved. I hate to tell you, it happens sometimes. Then you really need a city council that is capable of behaving the way we would want a diverse community to behave. Capable of listening to each other capable uh, um, of creating a space where people can actually say what they think so that that will add to decision making. And research after research after research indicates that when you have people from diverse backgrounds and when you have at least a third of the room is women and ideally uh, an equal representation, those uh, processes of real inclusion and real discussion and authentic decision making actually occur. And with the scale of the challenges that our civilization has, every key decision-making body in the world has to have that kind of inclusion. Otherwise, we're going to keep making stupid decisions. And this civilization is at stake. It really is. And so we're doing our best in the short term here to ensure that our public engagement, our civic initiatives, reflect that diversity that exists in our community so that where we can achieve consensus um, that it is informed by the broadest possible set of perspectives, including and especially the voice of women. But this work lies ahead of ensuring that our city council and our other elected organs better reflect the diversity of the city. And I am uh, as thrilled as anyone at uh, the example of the legislature and the cabinet these days. And I look forward, you know, the, 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 the competitive male thing to do would be to challenge you. Put up your hand if you're going to run for city council. <laughs> Let everyone know, you know, identify yourself right now. Okay, there's one. <laughs> I was right on. There you go. <laughs> but uh, but I just want to echo Bev's invitation or or even even exhortation to consider running. And maybe the by-election if councilor so he goes to Ottawa, Mr. So he goes to Ottawa there'll be a by-election right away. That creates one opportunity. I know there's at least one person in the room who is mindful of that opportunity, and you may know who she is as well. Um, I certainly do, and I'm happy to provide some continued mentorship there. Though I have to, I have to be a little careful about these things. But um, uh, yeah, don't run in Ward 6, and don't run for mayor in 2017. Just, <laughs> just saying, just saying. But uh, yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of other wards, and uh, besides Ward 6 and uh, Ward 2, uh, and I won't name any names. Um, but you should never feel afraid to run against an incumbent. Let me just say that. Um, uh, the conventional wisdom uh, from 1995 onward was, oh, don't bother. Or if you're running, like, you know, kind of run a positioning campaign, just get your name out there. and. Maybe when the councillor retires in another four years, maybe, maybe, maybe the opportunity will exist there. So, you know, maybe just put, put some signs out. And, and uh, everyone thought that's what I was doing in 2007. But I was actually running for office. <laughs> and people kept saying, oh, that's, that's really cute. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. So anyway, I won. It was super fun. You should try it, the running part. Um, but run to win. Um, because people can tell the difference. 
On the doorstep, they can tell the difference. At a forum, they can tell the difference. Because if you're trying really hard not to offend the candidate who you might be running against, the incumbent, because you might want them to endorse you in four years if they decide to retire, that timidity, people can see right through that. So it doesn't mean you'll win. But if next election, 17% of the candidates are women, what kind of result do you think we're going to get? So sorry, that's really passive aggressive to put it that in those terms. And to be like, so it's totally up to you, right? Like, I'm not a woman, I can't run for, I can't change the numbers. Um, Sarah though, no, no. She's smart enough not to get into this racket. I mean, you should all want to. So we have this, we have this work to do to increase the, uh, actually that reminds me. One of the things that we've done, because we recognize that there are a number of barriers to participation, and there are, some of them are barriers, and I've reflected a lot on this and, and sought a lot of opinion on this through our mentorship program and others. I've been really interested in the barriers that exist for younger people participating uh, in elected life, which are not all the same barriers that women face. There are certainly additional significant barriers that women face. But when you have kids or are thinking about having kids, uh, whether you're a prospective mom or dad, you start to have childcare issues. You start to think about, do I want to be out six nights a week uh, until eight or nine or ten at night and not see my kids all the time? Um, and the way we have structured um, these elected lives and the responsibilities that we're expected to undertake, go back to, you know, a hundred years ago when the city council um, in Edmonton was the doctors and the lawyers uh, and the business people who, after their day jobs, got together in a smoke-filled, booze-fueled city hall. Um, it's not like that at all anymore. <laughs> We're not allowed to smoke. <laughs> and uh, they would, as the fathers of the city, late into the night, when someone else was doing the child care, someone else was doing the unpaid work at home, um, and, uh, and, and, and strong women were probably running their businesses for them while they were off doing this. Um, they did the business of the city. They made the decisions for the community. And so many of the traditions that we have, even the calendar that we have, is just all stuck in a centuries-old, uh, extremely patriarchal, extremely elitist um, paradigm. And so our council has tried to make some changes to that. And it comes with some interesting tension, but one of, the, one of the changes that we've made is that we try not to work until the middle of the night anymore. So that uh, those of us who, well, anyone who wants to actually get asleep and be f functional the next day can have that option. But especially if you have kids, you might actually get home to see them once in a while, tuck them in, read them a story. And, and this became important for this council, I think, because in the last election, though our gender numbers um, deteriorated, our age number came way down, and the number of kids under 18 uh, in the care of, of uh, families of counselors and counselors went from 3 to 12. So a lot of us have younger kids, and I'm no longer sort of the outlier that, you know, once in a while would be like, well, you know, I'd like to get home to see my kids. Well, that's your problem. No, seriously, I was sort of told that, and actually, this, the day after my son was born, I got in a, some procedural wrangling, I was al supposed to be allowed to phone in for a part of a meeting, and um, then I was, I went home and was supposed to phone back for a key vote, and then council, because they didn't like what I was doing, said, yeah, no, you can't phone in. So, so my uh, parenthood in that case was procedurally used against me. And I wouldn't want to see that happen to anyone. No wonder only 17% of women were silly enough to step forward and say, yes, I'd like to be a part of that nonsense. So we're trying really hard to change that. We're trying really hard to change that. And I think you have a council that is sensitive to that. So whether it's a longer term goal around uh, child care, uh, and early learning supports for counselors' families so that um, more diverse kinds of families can be connected to City Hall, uh, or whether it's changing the calendar so that we end a little bit earlier, or changing the orders of the day of our meetings so we end a little bit earlier. 
uh, or whether it's changing the calendar to uh, include um, every fifth week we do something like a cons what they do a constituency week at the legislature. So you don't just sit and sit and sit and sit and sit like it's an endurance contest. You work for four weeks and then you take a week which you can either catch up on all your paperwork or take a trip with your family that isn't at Christmas or at, at uh, spring break when everyone else is trying to take their, their trip where, I mean, you have a little bit of flexibility in your life even just to go to the bank or get a doctor's appointment. So it's not like this endurance contest. So we've introduced that. Unfortunately, the unintended consequence of that is that all of our other meetings appear to be 25% longer and are becoming endurance contests. So these are the tensions that we bump into here. But with a, with a view to make the role of being an elected official in Edmonton a more family-friendly pursuit, we're, we're seeking to make those changes. So, I'm going to skip ahead here because uh, Bev's covered a lot of a lot of this other work. This is good. I'm skipping a bunch of pages here. <laughs> I want to, I mentioned at the beginning that I was going to talk to you a little bit about the poverty task force work. And, uh, you know, we kind of know this, but when you start to look in the numbers to see the overrepresentation of women and lone parent families that are overwhelmingly women in those numbers is pretty sobering stuff. The, the, the big number is 100,000 Edmontonians who live in poverty. Um, and 35,000 of those people are children. And overwhelmingly, in these groups, you see overrepresentation from uh, indigenous people, overrepresentation from immigrants and refugees, and where you're looking at old stock Canadians, if we can say that, <laughs> which we can't. <laughs> and shouldn't. I couldn't resist, though. When you're, when you're looking at um, multi-generational Canadians, I suppose, uh, settlers and descendants of settlers, properly speaking, um, the overrepresentation of uh, women uh, in single-parent families is staggering. So ending poverty is the right thing to do for a bunch of public policy reasons, but it's also an absolutely critical element of achieving gender equality. Or put differently, achieving gender equality would also help us eliminate poverty. And I'm not willing to wait 228 years for that. Alice, my daughter, is three. And though I am quite confident she will live to 231, <laughs> and if you've met her, you would know why, uh, I don't think she'll be content to wait that long either. And she'll be joining the struggle here pretty soon, I think. Um, she goes to a lot of events with Sarah, and that's a bit of a projection of the fact that it is okay to be a mother and, and also just a projection of the reality that we really struggle with childcare, like many of you, and, and, and having inadequate support uh, in our community for uh, parents with their kids to be able to fully participate in community life as a volunteer in a job, going to school. These are huge barriers to uh, gender equality, or put differently, huge barriers to participation in the labor force, or put differently, huge barriers towards the elimination of poverty. Which is why one of the key features of the work, um, and Bev was involved in this along with, I'm sure, some of you in the room, I see a few of you who are involved in the early learning and care uh, working group of the task force, which came forward with a recommendation that said, we need a, an integrated system of early learning and care in this city. There is a municipal role in putting that together. There is a provincial role in funding it. Not a municipal role, just to be, you guys <laughs> help us out with that. It's in the platform. Uh, but there is some urgency around this, because the difference it will make, not just for Sarah, but more importantly for those women who are uh, experiencing economic marginalization and other kinds of marginalization. The, you know, there are a few game changers. We came up with 28 recommendations in the, in the End Poverty Edmonton strategy. And uh, there are a few game changers and a, an integrated system of early learning and care for the benefit of those kids who we know will participate less in the justice system, participate more in the education system, participate less in uh, the healthcare system and participate more in the employment and economic system, that the return on investment there is the best investment we can make in the future. It just so happens it will also be a huge, huge support 
for those lone parent families and any family that is struggling to fully participate in community life. And that's our, that's our definition of, uh, of poverty, is when people lack or are denied the resources to fully participate in community life. And it is, there's no doubt that there's an economic dimension to this. But one of the things that we learned that was very, very powerful from our Aboriginal Roundtable uh, is that uh, poverty is not only about money. It is very often, and most of the time, uh, in large part about money, but it is not only about that. And we learned something very powerful, which is that the Cree word for poverty doesn't talk about money at all. It talks about being impoverished in terms of connection to community. And that can be spiritual, that can be bodily, it can, but it's a very integrated um, sense of, uh, of deprivation. And so our strategy to end poverty must address all of those features. And I talked a little bit before about uh, the need for this as, a, as an act of reconciliation, and I believe very strongly that that is one of the last pieces of... Um, nation building left to do in our country is to achieve reconciliation among indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. And when we see over-representation, <laughs> when we see over-representation of the kind that we do um, uh, of women in poverty, and especially uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit women in poverty, and then understand the fairly obvious correlation between the fact that um, if you are homeless in this city, you are ten times more likely to be homeless if you're Aboriginal. If you are um, an Aboriginal child, you are twice as likely to be living in poverty. And if you are an Aboriginal woman or girl, you are four times as likely to go missing or be murdered. So, this is important work. Ending poverty will help support not only changing those statistics, but achieving real reconciliation. And this is important because we talk about being on Treaty 6 territory. And uh, I'll, I'll just ask a question. I'll put you on the spot. Are there any treaty people here? Put up your hand. You'll notice my hand is up, and I will explain to you why every person in this room's hand should be up in answer to that question. The treaty is not with indigenous people. You have to imagine who's the other party to the treaty. These are nation-to-nation -nation relationships. The other party to the treaty is technically the queen or the government or the country, but it, is, it says, if you go and read it, and I encourage you to check it out, it's not a long document. Uh, the treaty is between, in our case, the Confederacy of Treaty Six First Nations, which includes 17 First Nations uh, from this area and, and east into Saskatchewan and a little bit of Manitoba. But it is between uh, the Queen on behalf of settlers and descendants of settlers forever. This wasn't like a little one-time thing they worked out in 1876 that we don't need to worry about. It, uh, it binds us as long as the grass grows, as long as the rivers flow, as long as the... I'm paraphrasing. There's some <laughs> lovely, lovely language in the treaty, though, that it says this is permanent. This is a permanent treaty, which is actually a pretty remarkable thing. But what we've forgotten, or maybe didn't mean, when the representatives of the Queen uh, signed these documents back in 1876 and the subsequent adhesions to the treaty um, was that this was a partnership that was being formed in exchange for indigenous peoples welcoming settlers onto these lands and sharing in the bounty of these resources um, and agreeing to peaceful cooperation and coexistence and partnership um, the crown committed to certain things as well, which arguably we're not living up to, and we see that in uh, the over-representation numbers that I talked about before. You see that in the conditions on reserves, and we hear Perry Bellegarde, who's the uh, Grand Chief, uh, talking about the need to close the gap, 
uh, between the living conditions of, uh, I mean, the OECD numbers or the, the, the UN numbers that talk about where we are um, uh, as a country are declining. And we saw that one example of where we're at with gender equality. If you take out, and we've all heard these numbers too, if you, if you separate uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians, the situation's a little bit better for Indigenous Canadians because it's so bad for non-Indigenous Canadians that it's actually pulling the numbers apart. And this is, this is indefensible and it's creating challenges in our city, it's creating this poverty, it's contributing to continued deep gender inequality. Um, and so it must be addressed. And the reason I wanted to talk a little bit about this and to familiarize with you uh, with, with the treaty is to, is to really boil it down to a great metaphor that Bob Ray uh, offered up at the, uh, the Walrus Talks here, the Aboriginal City Walrus Talks a little while ago. He said the treaties um, can be looked at one of two ways. The way the federal government looks at it is that uh, they're a divorce. It's a settlement. This is mine, that's yours, we give you this money, now leave us alone. And every time they go to court, they argue basically from that perspective. They keep losing because the indigenous groups come and argue uh, something that boils down to a much better uh, foundation for nation building, which is this was a marriage. This is ours. We're in this together. And they keep winning over and over and over. And I think that rather than our country continuing to be a deadbeat dad, which arguably we have been, we should really embrace the fact that we are all in this together. And I think that that's a better foundation for, for nation building, it's a better foundation for city building, and it's why we talk so much about the treaty, because if we really live and breathe the spirit of what Treaty 6 stands for, everybody will benefit. First Nations, Métis, and Inuit children and women and men will be properly included in community life. That would be reconciliation. That's my definition of reconciliation. And in the process, while we were doing all of that, um, full inclusion in community life, as we talk about in the poverty report, would be achieved. And with it, um, meaningful and complete participation for women, which I think has to be the goal. And I'm glad to have had the opportunity to come and preach to you about that a little bit this morning. As you see, I'm quite passionate about it. Um, and I see I'm about to get the hook from Sandra here, because <laughs> I've gone on too long. But um, I wanted to talk to you all about how housing is critically important to this, and that the housing policy from some of the federal parties is actually offensively bad. Um, but I'm going to be good and not say anything about that. So it's a good thing I ran out of time. So there's, uh, there'll be no need for a people like Iveson hashtag. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>